I find it fascinating that Georgian masculinity is reproduced in Mel. Mel. Mm. <clears throat> and Then We Danced is a celebration of love and Georgian pride, written and directed by the Swedish Georgian filmmaker Liv Anakin. Apart from the incredible acting and its mesmerizingly cinematic shots, which do draw many parallels with Call Me By Your Name. You're going to see this shot multiple times, I apologize. And Then We Danced offers one of the most genuine gay representations in modern cinema. In being both a love letter to Georgia and a queer movie simultaneously, it portrays an intersection which almost nobody dares to talk about. And yet, even though the movie's plot is almost completely void of politics, it is in fact deeply political. <laughs> When the movie was first shown at the 2019 Cannes Film Festival, it received a 15-minute standing ovation, while back in Georgia, viewers to the three sold-out screenings first had to make their way through a corridor of shame made up of hundreds of violent protesters, a rainbow flag burning in the background. This was not a reaction to some change in law, but simply to the screening of the first explicitly queer movie in Georgia in 2019. And Then We Danced tells the story of Merab, a young dancer in the National Georgian Ensemble, in his everyday struggles between dance classes, his part-time job at a Georgian restaurant, and family life at home. Merab is constantly told that his dancing is not masculine enough, and that he does not have what it takes to be a true Georgian dancer. When the naturally talented Irakli joins the ensemble, he soon becomes the centre of Merab's attention, not only as a potential rival in the upcoming auditions for a place in the National Ballet, but also as a potential lover. We see Merab smiling for the first time on the bus home from training, Irakli asleep on his shoulder, as their relationship is about to unfold. Quite frankly, it is hard to imagine how a movie with this much love and warmth could possibly receive the amount of hate and death threats that it did. But in order to understand why this film is so deeply political, we must look at it from a traditional Georgian point of view. Levan Akin chose Georgian dance to be at the centre of this film for a good reason. To be a Georgian dancer in the National Ballet requires immense athletic ability, physical strength and confidence. Georgian dance is the epitome of masculinity and deeply rooted into the culture of the country. It is typically led by men who take up a stronger and more powerful role than women. <laughs> Patriarchal norms are deeply rooted into Georgian society. Men are viewed as the main decision makers, heads of family, and mostly, they are also the only breadwinners in the family. As one would expect, a highly patriarchal society will express greater homophobic attitudes, as homosexuality and gender non-conforming behaviour is seen as an attack on hegemonic masculinity. A 2017 paper named Exploring Homophobia in Tbilisi, Georgia confirms this suggestion, showing that men express stronger homophobic attitudes. According to gender panic theory, this is driven by the fear of losing male status and privilege, and this is also why Georgian dance is so important to Georgian culture. Boys take dancing lessons from an early age and quite quickly learn that their status as a man and that of their family partly depends on how well they can perform these traditional dances. And tradition, by all means, must be respected, especially in the country that has been struggling to defend its culture throughout history. I find it fascinating that Georgian masculinity is reproduced in ballet, which, from a Western perspective, seems like the most feminine profession of all. But this perfectly shows that cultural norms and gender roles are always context-specific. Did you know, for example, that before World War II, pink was the more masculine colour, while blue was associated with girls. It was only after the war that pink got the symbolic association that we have today. Which is to say that the context can always change. And the movie plays with this idea, initiating the possible beginning of a cultural shift. In the closing scene, Mara auditions in front of the director of the National Ballet, despite having fractured his ankle a few days before. When this causes him to fall, he finally rejects the hypermasculine dance, having accepted his own identity, and instead creates his unique style of dance, which incorporates more feminine, vogue-like elements into Georgian dance. 
This hybrid dance between tradition and progression is exactly what Levan Akin is wanting Georgia to see. Instead of rejecting these traditions entirely, we can reinterpret them from our own point of view to create something unique and beautiful to change the context. Unfortunately, a lot of people mistake these new creations for the erosion of tradition, fearing that a more progressive culture would leave them with less and not more. In order to prevent any such progressive movements, the LGBTQ plus community becomes the center of attack. Although Georgia has decriminalized homosexuality in 2000s, the effects of the cultural gay taboo live on long beyond any change in law. This is not only true for Georgia, but the entire world. It was only in 1990 that the WHO stopped putting homosexuality on its list of psychological illnesses. After decades of punishing and stigmatizing queer people, not to mention the grotesque persecution of gay people during the NS regime, arresting around 100,000 homosexual men, of which about 5,000 were murdered in concentration camps. These ideas and associations with queer people are still reproduced in our collective culture today, even when laws change. To this day, homosexuals are named by Georgians as second only to drug addicts as the most unwanted group. Surprisingly, in the 1990s, homosexuals were not viewed as negatively as they are today. The Rose Revolution in November 2003 marked the end of the Soviet-era leadership in Georgia, which was replaced by pro-Western leaders following new elections. These drastic political and institutional changes did not automatically translate into progressive cultural change, but instead triggered a series of anti-liberal movements. The World Values Survey from 2010 to 2014 found that 86% of Georgians would object to having a gay neighbour, and almost the same percentage found homosexuality never to be justified. The rise in homophobic attitudes during the 2000s and 2010s can be seen as a reflection of fear and uncertainty in the future of the country, stuck between European and Soviet-influenced values. These were not just private attitudes, but instead they often turned into violent public manifestations. In fact, Levan Akin's inspiration for this movie came from the violent reactions to the country's first Pride event on May 17th, 2013. An estimated 50 LGBTQ activists were outnumbered by thousands of counter-protesters who violently attacked the peaceful celebrations, causing several of the activists to be hospitalized. Having seen that, I thought that I should, you know, go to Georgia and see if, you know, I could do something about this topic. It is quite ironic that these violent protests, which served as a source of inspiration for the movie, later reoccurred during its premiere. But something had changed. Although the anti-LGBTQ protests received all the media attention, there is a growing body of acceptance that is becoming more and more powerful in Georgian society. The most recent World Values Survey posits that 59% of Georgians would not like to have homosexual neighbours. While hostile attitudes towards gay people are still prevalent within the majority of the population, one can still speak of a sort of cultural shift happening right now. Compared with the 86%, the rate of queer hostility is obviously much lower today than it was just a few years earlier. When movie tickets for the Georgian premiere went on sale in 2019, 6,000 of them were sold online in under 15 minutes. And this change in attitude is also reflected in the movie. There is a beautiful scene in the movie where Merab's mother and grandmother are arguing over the fiancé of Merab's brother David. I heard she's Armenian, the grandmother says. To which the mother responds, Jesus Christ, who cares if she is? The grandmother could just as well have said gay, and we would expect younger generations to say just that. Jesus Christ, who cares? The conservatives that vehemently defend their rigid understanding of tradition no longer represent the overall Georgian attitudes. In this way, Georgia is experiencing a cultural divide between the predominantly younger progressive generations and the anti-liberal conservatives with close ties to the Orthodox Church. That being said, we must be careful not to create this rigid binary between older and younger generations. When looking at the proportion of 18 to 25 year olds in the 2010 and 2014 World Values Survey, homophobic attitudes are lower than older generations as expected, yet not significantly. 
as 79% of younger people still object to having homosexual neighbours, claiming that homosexuality was a disease and that these people could not be trusted. Even in the movie, many of the dancers in Merab's group support these ideas. When one of them finds out that a former male dancer of the National Ballet has been sent to a monastery for having had sex with another man, she simply states that this is to make him normal again. Rather than looking at age, what the authors of the 2017 paper found was that the level of education was a much stronger factor at predicting homophobic attitudes. Higher education is generally linked to an expression of more liberal values, and thus, as younger people become more educated, one would expect a shift in attitudes, particularly in these generations. Yet this cultural divide between liberal and conservative values is greatly influenced by George's most powerful neighbour, making this divide, above all, a political one. Of course, I am talking about Russia. And if you're now wondering what has power politics got to do with a queer indie art house movie, Probs to you for making it this far and raising the important question as to why you are listening to a lesson in international relations and survey statistics when all you wanted was a cute video essay about another tragically heartbreaking but beautiful gay movie. Bear with me just a little longer. Following the Russia-Georgian war in 2008, more than 20% of Georgian territory is now occupied by Russia and it is expanding. From inside the two occupied regions, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, Russian forces are claiming more and more Georgian territory for themselves, an attempt named borderization. The intention of Russia, similar to the current war in the Ukraine, is to prevent the former Soviet countries to become Western allies and join the NATO, which would weaken Russia's power and isolate the country in a predominantly liberal world order. This is what Putin fears, and it is why Russia attempts to gain control in these regions through all means possible, including the offensive attack of the queer community. With terms such as gay Europa, Russian propaganda is trying to spread the idea that Europe and the West is turning all children gay. And that the only way to stop this is to ban all open conversations around sexuality. And so, surprise surprise, Russian forces have been known to fund and support anti-LGBTQ movements in Georgia and Europe more broadly. In Georgia, you take it. There are every year these LGBT prides. The police are going to kill anyone? Тем, кто выступает против. Обратите внимание, грузины тоже разные. Там есть грузины, которые выходят и бьют их там. With platforms such as Citizen Go, Russia has been immensely successful at propagating anti-gender and transphobic ideology in both Eastern and Western European countries. These billion dollar campaigns are effectively spreading homophobic propaganda, framing queer people as a threat to the natural family and traditional values, with the drastic consequence of ever increasing attacks on trans people and the alarming popularity of ultra-conservative political parties across Europe. Furthermore, Russia has just recently introduced a new homophobic law banning so-called propaganda of non-traditional sexual relations for all age groups. Since 2012, this queer censorship had only applied to minors, but with the extension to all of society, it now makes it illegal to even just openly talk about queer issues in any form or space. The timing of this homophobic law just after Russia's invasion of the Ukraine is no coincidence. LGBTQ people have become Russia's scapegoat, a sort of distraction from the atrocities of the war. Or as Levan Akin puts it in an interview with The Advocate, the LGBTQ issue is Russia's weapon to make people afraid of going to the West. And although the protesters to the movie screening were presented as nationalist patriots that claim to protect Georgian culture and tradition, Akin believes that if they really wanted to protect Georgia, they'd be screaming at the borders of the Russian guards, but they're not. And so the violent reaction to the movie's premiere is more than just cultural conservatism. It is the result of Russian propaganda against the West aiming to divide a country whose national unity has always been ambiguous. In this way, the attack on the queer community is not so much about the intrinsic hatred towards gay people, but rather a strategic move of rejecting liberal Western values. If the protesters had actually seen this movie, they might have found themselves 
genuinely proud of their country. Its music, its dance, its cuisine, and above all, its people. A sort of pride that Merab embodies. What I love so much about this movie is that the protagonist never questions his own worth. Merab knows to act cautiously in a country where homosexuality will get you ejected from the National Ballet and most other institutions. We get to see this the first time Merab and Rackley make love, too afraid to kiss each other and become more intimate. Yet, Marab is rarely ashamed of himself or his sexuality, something incredibly refreshing after an era of queer protagonists who often drown in self-hatred and struggle to accept their own sexuality. Instead, Marab has learned to adapt to his hostile country in order to survive. When asked whether him and his close girlfriend were a couple, he is forced to agree. Yet he's never plagued by guilt or shame. I especially love the scene where Marab is coming out to his brother David at the end of the movie. After alluding to his homosexuality, Marab holds eye contact with David, expecting to be hit. Yet his brother proceeds to reach out his hand with the words, You've always been better than me. You have no future here. This sentence is representative for millions of queer people across Eastern Europe and countries in which queerness is still not recognised. For us as viewers, this points the problem not towards gay people, but towards the societal structures that we live in. Gay people can also be comfortable in their sexuality, even in a homophobic country like Georgia. The only problem being the intolerance of others. And while it is still true that queer people are forced to leave their home country simply for who they are, creating awareness and representation of queer people through movies like these also bears the hope of greater acceptance. In this context, the 2017 study found that personal contact with homosexuals was found to be positively associated with acceptance and equal rights for homosexuals. If people personally know someone who is homosexual, they tend to believe that sexual minorities should have the same rights as others. And this is exactly why representation matters so much. In movies, in literature, in the media, in public spaces, in politics. For if people cannot present themselves the way they truly are, they will never truly be understood. It is this message that I wish I had heard growing up, and that I hope younger people who are ashamed of their sexuality will hear more often. We will not let an intolerant culture dictate how we feel about ourselves. Possibly my favourite scene is during the trip to the country house, when Murab performs his own dance in front of Rurakli at dawn, wearing only a pair of boxer shorts and a traditional Caucasian wool hat. We see Murab freeing himself from all the necessary constraints that he had to practice all his life. In this moment, in front of Rurakli, he is safe, maybe for the first time. Even in a place in which queer people have no future, we will always create moments of true freedom, even if only fleeting. Thank you so much for watching this very long and not at all controversial video essay. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, go watch this movie. It has just been released to Mubi, um, which is a platform for smaller independent art house movies um this is not sponsored in any way i wish it was uh i'm genuinely a huge fan of movie so go support them if you want to watch the movie i am hoping to do more video essays like these in the future kind of combining many different social issues and things that are going on related to the movie so if you like this it would mean a lot if you uh, shared this and let me know what parts you like the most and what kind of movies you would like to see in the future so yeah thank you so much for listening and go watch this movie thank you <laughs>